Tonight on Joy News Prime, there's yet another call on government to ban conventional plastics, even as it takes steps to manage the menace in the system. We have to manage plastic. We don't consider plastic as a, as a waste or felt as such, but it's a resource that can be utilized to create employment and to generate wealth. And so, in the first place, uh, a ban can be considered, but that should not be the first thing. But even as the ban is being contemplated, we tell you about the locally produced biodegradable plastics made from cassava starch. If there's no alternative, we cannot ban it. And now we have the alternative, we have the solution to Ghana's problem, even Africa's problem. And, and we think that we have the solution. So what is in the solution? What, what solution is that? This is just warm water. Okay. Now the warm water is representing the, uh, the environment, the temperature at which this, pro this product will be exposed to. President Kufado urges Africans to desist from conniving with Westness to steal from the continent. People come to do business with us and they steal, and we help them steal. We have to find a way of putting, bringing those things to an end, the looting of our continent that is taking place. And there's technology that could toughen your phone screen so it won't break when it falls. And it's not a screen protector. Just a two drop. And I'll apply this one as well. Yes, a drop. Um, Israel Laya and Joy News Prime comes to you from, live from the Joy News Street at Kokum Limley here in Accra with digital address GA0992539. Stay tuned in. Ghana has a major problem managing plastic waste, especially as 73% of all imported plastics effectively end up as waste. Virtually everywhere you turn, Ghanaians are coming into contact with single-use polythings that tend to be discarded indiscriminately. But the situation is even more worrying when you consider the fact that naturally plastics do not decompose while not much of it, it is recycled. But there's an innovation that's set to change this order, a team. In this year's final of the Cosmos Innovation Challenges, manufactured biodegradable plastics from cassava starch, which according to them, decomposes in less than six months. Henry Kwesi Perdue has details in the following report. To many people, the mere mention of cassava brings Fufu, Gary or Ampesi to mind. A group of young innovators, however, found a way of producing biodegradable plastics from cassava. Agroplast is a team in this year's KIC challenge that has produced a starch-based plastic that completely decomposes in just six months. On our market research, we went to Ejra and some other areas that produces cassava a lot. And the main problem is lack of, you know, markets for their produce. So a lot of them go waste. And so these produce that go waste, we are using to produce bioplastic. And this plastic will degrade in a matter of six months after it has been used. So it means that this produce is solving the issue of uh, the, the, the farmer produce going waste and the plastic waste in the country. So in development of our plastic, our bioplastic, we use cassava. And so it serves as the backbone of our, the plastic we develop instead of the hydrocarbon. First, we have to extract the starch out of these cassava tubers by, blend, by cutting or peeling and then blending and obtaining our slurry. After we obtain our slurry, we have certain chemical substances which are organic in nature, which aid in the uh, plastic formation. These, are, these substances are plasticizers, such as sorbitol. We have the sorbitol, which aids in it. We also have the glycerol. And then we have the vinegar, which serves as um, acid in boosting the plastic production. So, you know, after this, what happens? What do you do? All right. So after this whole process, after um, making a, a solution out of the starch and these chemical substances, what we do is that we have to um, uh, leave it or expose it to the oven for drying. After the drying process, we are able to obtain a film, a slide film from that which holds a plastic property. And out of that foam, at a large industrial area, we are able to convert this foam into mulching foams, um, polyethylene bags, and other plastic materials or products which we use in our daily lives. 
This innovation is a solution to Ghana's plastic pollution problem, which has reached alarming levels, clogging drains, and gradually suffocating aqua life. In fact, a UNDP report states that out of over 1.7 million tons of annual plastic waste, only 2% of it is recycled. The young innovators show a simple experiment of how rapid the starch-based plastic decomposes in warm water. In comparison to the conventional plastic, the biodegradable plastic dissolved in a matter of minutes after it was dipped into warm water. Yeah, this, this, this are, are one of our produce. Oh, okay. Yes. And it's made from starch, pure starch. Okay. Yes. And so we have, and this is the conventional plastic, the normal plastic we use every day. They are all low density. Yes. So, so we can, this is our own. So what is in the solution? What, what solution is that? This is just warm water. Okay. Now the warm water is representing the uh, the environment, the temperature at which this put this product will be exposed to, mm. for it to degrade or decompose. And this is the conventional plastic. Okay. We can put it here as well. So what, what is happening? Yes, yeah, so our produce, our, our, our product, the bioplastic is dissolved completely as compared to the conventional one, which is still strong in the warm water we have here. So, yes, yeah, so if the camera can capture it, you see it dissolved completely. Yes, it dissolved completely as compared to the conventional plastic, which is still, you know, strong. Now, the conventional plastic takes a maximum of 400 to 1,000 years to degrade completely from the environment. But our product is six months. But based on the use, we have the formula we can adjust the component that will make it extend to at least one year. Because some, some of farmers or what we use in our homes, you know, are not single use, or maybe uh, we use it in the long term. So we can adjust our components in such a way that they can meet its use. Agroplast believes they have found a solution to the long-standing battle of reducing plastic waste. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. We, we were actually privileged to be part of uh, the launch of the National Plastic Action Partnership with the president. And what he mentioned is that they were trying to commit resources to, you know, uh, innovations like ours, so that the, the government can support as to make sure that because if there's no alternative, we cannot ban it. And now we have the alternative, we have the solution to Ghana's problem, even Africa's problem. And, and we think that we have the solution. And so all we need is the support from uh, you know, uh, all the other places that can help us. The Minister of Environment, Science and Technology, Professor Frimpong Boatin, has stated that the country will not ban plastics until there's an alternative. This is a very complex issue. We have to manage plastic. We don't consider plastic as a, as a waste or felt as such, but it's a resource that can be utilized to create employment and to generate wealth. And so in the first place, uh, a ban can be considered, but that should not be the first thing because already we have challenges. A lot of people, if we take sachet water, for example, because we are polluted our water bodies, people in our communities, especially in the mining areas, don't have access to the water because the water is not, cannot be used for domestic purposes. And therefore, they rely on, on plastic sachet water. So uh, not until we have dealt with those other problems and make sure that there are alternatives, uh, I don't think we can ban the plastic now. For now, cassava plastic appears to be an innovation that the country should consider investing in. Henry Kwisubedu for Joy News. And we'll be coming back to this conversation about uh, cassava plastics or biodegradable plastics and what the people who will be using it make of it. Meanwhile, civil society organizations championing a cleaner Ghana have called on government to place a ban on conventional plastics well, it takes measures to manage the plastic menace in the system. The worsening plastic menace, according to them, is threatening the existence of mankind. Dr. Philip Amwa spoke on behalf of the groups at the 7th West African Clean Energy and Environment Conference here in Accra. In terms of handling uh, plastics, you buy 
um, a small one CD worth of porridge. It is put in a plastic container, a white one. And then that white one is put in another black container, tied nicely. And then the whole thing is now put in another bag which you can carry. So for just one CD worth of cocoa that you bought or the porridge that you bought, three polythene bags. So I've made it my habit that if I buy anything like that, I take only one, you see? Now, it's our behavior. If we're able to, to, to actually um, handle this, 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 this menace very well, that would be fine. But the way we behave, throwing plastic bags around. I, I was in an organization, and uh, we, we actually decided that we are not going to use plastic cups anymore because people come to the office, they drink, like we have here around this, this place. They drink, and they put a plastic container there. So if you have 100 people visiting the office, they are produ uh, uh, actually uh, producing waste on coats, waste plastic bags, caps. See, these days people are trying to actually uh, come out maybe even something that is recyclable. It can be a cup, but if it is a paper cup, for example, it can be recycled, and that is better. Or we can even ask people to even go to shops with their own carrier bags. If you go to a shop and you buy something and uh, you are told that it's not going to be packaged for you, you know that I have to go in there with my own a, a, a polythene bag or my, or my own carrier, my own basket, and that is fine. So I think it's, it's time we start looking at some of these solutions in order to address, or to be able to address this uh, plastic but issue. I, 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 that's my personal opinion. If it is banned, I know it's going to affect so many people, but if it is banned, so because of the way we behave, it, 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 for me it is fine. Let's get on to the phone line now and speak with the national president of the Association of Sashi Water Producers, Magnus Nunu. Thank you very much for making time to speak with us, Mr. Nunu. Now, you've heard about the biodegradable uh, plastics made from cassava starch. What do you make of this innovation? I think it's brilliant and uh, it is something we all welcome. But I, I hope it's going to go the full length and uh, survive. You know, in Ghana... People come out with ideas, and I wonder if we have a budget for something like that. But this is something with resilience. I mean, it's coming from the fact that it's coming from Ghanaian, you know. Uh, we can go really very, very far. Plastic, plastic menace is a real issue in the country. And of course, if you are getting something that can really help to minimize uh, plastic uh, pollution, I think it's something that we all welcome. Now, I'm speaking, we're speaking with you because essentially the amount of plastic waste we find in the system, most of it, it turns out, comes from sachet, used sachet bags. Does this work for you, biodegradable plastics? So, because sometimes these things are produced, but it turns out that it may not work for the kind of thing you produce, the water you produce. Yes, and as, as I speak, from where I sit, as uh, so far as I know, I know there's a policy in the country where all forms of uh, flexible plastic that are produced in the country are supposed to contain some amount of oxo biodegradable additive. I mean, with its food grade, even with the sachet that we use, we're supposed to have it. I know the uh, EPA, uh, you know, during the actual government, there was a policy, and so uh, all plastic manufacturers were mandated. Uh, by that policy to include uh, also biodegradable, and it was actually ongoing. And the, I suppose it's the case, you know, and Ghana nothing really works if you are not if you are not really controlling on top of the issues. But then I knew the EPA. They were even having issues where the EPA had come out with a unique supplier, you know, and that's what they we're kicking against. But then. Uh, as to whether it is still enforced, I don't really know. But so then I how, know the policy like that. Mr. Nunu, how does that work? This biodegradable one that you're talking about that the EP was uh, trying to enforce, how does it work? Is yeah, so it is so it what, completely biodegradable or partially biodegradable? Um, I mean, all biodegradable materials are partially biodegradable in the sense that, I mean, uh, it takes time for to degrade. If it's complete, completely degradable, that means that once you put it in, then it starts degrading there and then. But I, I, what I know is that, I mean, within uh, less than a year, it's supposed to uh, decompose and then uh, degrade into the soil. That's what I know. And so, I mean, all sachet water you see on the market at the moment and all these plastics that are there, if it is being enforced, I believe that the EPA will be in a better position to tell. But it has been tested, and uh, for us who use plastics, uh, who produce sachet water, I knew 
some time back that our plastic that we're using actually contains biodegradable. Now, if you just go across Ghana to the next country, Togo, that one is, you know, they are very strict when it comes to this enforcement. All plastic that are produced there contain some bio, also biodegradable. And so now, if somebody is coming up, I mean, using and some or something, it is, I mean, it's more than what Because this one, for example, if you are going to use, introduce uh, biodegradable into something with its food, which you're using for food, then you also must make sure that it's not going to be harmful to the human body. And then coming from the agri sector, you are very, very certain that uh, it's something that really is safe. Uh, uh, there that the body can accommodate. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus Nunu. He is the uh, national president of the Sashi Water uh, Producers Association. Moving on, President Kufado is optimistic. Only hard work can turn the economic fortunes of Africa after swallowing $600 billion worth of donor funds, but with very little to show for it. But even before the hard work starts, the president wants the continent to be more patriotic and desist from helping others, mostly foreign firms, to steal from Africa. Addressing the United Nations Development Program on Africa, Money for African Development Conference here in Accra, the president indicated his government has prioritized human development as key to economic growth. So what are our own priorities? How do we um, envisage the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And therefore, what are the things we need to put in place to make those 5, 10, 20 years meaningful for our people? For me, the AF, AFTA, which has come about, is an important step for us. It provides us with a platform to be able to connect with each other. Already we're seeing challenges. Uh, we've seen challenges that are taking place in ECOWAS in, uh, in how to develop a regional community. But these are challenges that we will overcome. I'm very confident about that. But I think that more than anything else is the attitude that we have about our own countries. People come to do business with us and they steal, and we help them steal. We have to find a way of putting, bringing those things to an end, the looting of our continent that is taking place. Outsiders, perhaps I can understand them. Yeah, they, they have uh, everything to gain and very little to lose. But we have a lot to lose in assisting people to continue to loot our resources. So it's all part of how, what your own sense of self, your own sense of self-worth is, your sense of, if you like, a very hackneyed term, but which is important, patriotism. How does that weigh in the scales of all of us? How much importance do we attach to acting in a way which is about the, the collective and not about the me? I think it's a whole set of attitudes and um, perspectives that we need to put together, which will then make it relatively easy for us to see the way forward. President Kufuado, at his inaugural address in January 2017, declared a Ghana Beyond Aid agenda, which meant that the country was to look within for homegrown solutions rather than reliance on loans and handouts from the West. That proclamation, according to the president, however, appears to be making some world leaders uncomfortable. When this Beyond Aid developments took place, uh, a lot of people that I met were somehow very nervous. Was I preaching some anti-foreign, anti-European, anti-white, anti-American, or whatever uh, doctrine? I remember uh, the first time I met Jean-Claude Juncker, the president of the European Commission. That was his question. Michel Kufuado, what is this thing about Ghana beyond aid? It's, 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 there's nothing uh, extraordinary about it. We have to depend on ourselves. Is there something wrong with that? So, no, no, of course not. So well, that's all Ghana beyond aid is, is that we need to depend on ourselves. We need to find the policies, the resources that will enable us to stand on our own feet. There's nothing... <laughs> There's nothing in that which is meant to be hostile to people who are, who are investing in our continent, wanting to help. Why, why not? A great deal of the, all the economies, the great economies of the world, that are, a lot of them, all of them up till now, depend a lot on foreign investment. There's German uh, 
investors who helped develop the American Railway, which was such a catalytic event in the development of the United States. The monies that were raised to develop the railways were raised in, on the stock markets of Europe. So that interlinking and the interfacing between peoples are there. But we need always to apply whatever we're doing. The 2020 budget will be presented to Parliament next week and already the minority is threatening to block approval of it. The minority MPs are upset with their finance minister Ken Oforiata, who they accuse of illegally starving district assemblies across the country of much needed funds. They claim the situation has left assemblies in financial crisis unable to meet the urgent and development needs of the people. Benjamin Podo, ranking member on the local government committee, questions the president's commitment to decentralization. Some or most of our assemblies rely mainly on the DACF for funds to finance their activities. And the mass of our people are looking forward to their assemblies to deliver services to them. Staff of the assemblies go to work and do nothing because there is no money. Fact is that the Ministry of Finance has failed to release the 5% of realized revenue to the DACF to enable the assemblies to function. Sanitation bills, contractor certificates, and supplies invoices are all outstanding. It is abundantly clear from the above that President Nana Ado Dankwa Kufuado's government does not believe in decentralization, and all what they are doing is just paying lip service to the very important aspect of our governance. We ask, has the D ACF being rendered moribund? Is the Constitution, Article 2522, not being blatantly violated? Is it that no revenues were realized within the past six months, such that they cannot transfer the monies to the assemblies? What has the Minister of Finance used the constitutionally provided DACF money for over the past seven months? That is from April to October. What have they used the money for? We demand that the Minister of Finance should come out clearly to tell the nation how much is being held as DCF money. We demand that the Minister of Finance should, without any further delay, release all amounts due to the DACF for the second and third quarters of 2019. Well, Deputy Local Government Minister Obi Amor has however denied or uh, described the claims uh, as untrue. He says the DSCF for the second quarter has been released and that it is only the third quarter that is outstanding. Moving on, breaking cocoa pots to scoop out the beans on a large scale could be sometimes a tiring task, in fact, labor intensive and time consuming. But one of the finalists in this year's Cosmos Innovation Agritech Challenge, Cocoa, Aboye has manufactured an automated port breaking machine to simplify the process. Into this edition of Tech Thursday, joining us is Henry Kwesibad, who has been speaking with the innovators in a small in the following report read to you. Cutting cocoa for beans out of the ports is not an easy task. Many farmers spend days and weeks breaking their backs to get the beans for drying. That time could have been invested in other equally demanding tasks. At Tutuka, a small community in the Shitifi North District of the Bonohavu region, Isifu Dauda has been cultivating cocoa for the past 27 years. He narrates his ordeal during his last harvest as he hired extra labor to help break his ports. Koko no bono, e ya jumo biya edin, sanse, se koko no doswa. In breaking my koko ports, I either hire people or use friends and family. It's time consuming. I need the help of about 30 people to break my ports. I'm a little bit of 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 a little
He is aging and has developed weak limbs, so in the future, he would rely entirely on farm hands. But there is an innovation that will make breaking ports easy. Cocoa Boy, a team in this year's final of the Cosmos Innovation Center's Agritech Challenge, has devised an automated cocoa pot splitter. The prototype dubbed the Aboye Master, according to the team, will make the task of getting cocoa beans less burdensome. Cocoa Boy basically started with one, one of our team who is a cocoa farmer himself. And um, he told us about the stress and the plight that he goes through when it's during the major cocoa season. There are a lot of cocoa pods that are being harvested and it, they need about um, six or seven people to break like a ton of cocoa. Hearing this and then going to the field, um, Mumuni in the western region and then Asim Fosu, the cocoa growing areas, we went to witness ourselves the struggles that cocoa farmers are going through. The chief farmer have to pay people to do this, um, little children have to job from school in order to help break this pot. So looking at all this stress and all these challenges that the farmers are going through before breaking all this, we sat down and decided to come out with a mechanized something to help ease all this burden. The cocoa pots are placed on a beam and a machine wheels them to two blades strategically placed at the end to perfectly cut the cocoa pot without cutting the beams. The Abuela Master is basically made of um, two conveyors with loaders attached to it. Um, two blades, one at the top and one at the base. And um, the pots are loaded on the conveyor with the motor running. It pushes the pot underneath the blade and then the blade slices through the pot to cut it open, which then goes to another part that helps in the removal of the beam from the pot. And the blade is made in such a way that there's one, one on top and one beneath. And um, the diameter of the blade has been done in such a way that it doesn't touch the bean itself. It just cuts through the thickness of the pot without damaging the bean. According to innovators, the machine splits a ton of cocoa in an hour. After developing the Aboye Master and then running a series of tests, we are very certain that within an hour, we'll be able to break 1,000 pots with no defect. That the efficiency is about 97 or 99%. We're going to break 1,000 pots and we are working on increasing that efficiency to like 2,000 or 2 tons per an hour. Cocoa farmers like Isifu believes such innovations could ease their plight. Because I said, and I said, 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 I will help farmers to extract beans and boost mass cocoa production. Henry Kwesi Bedus report for Joy News. In July this year, Joy News brought to light the story of 11-year-old Bisma Trevor who had a severe spine dislocation after falling from a fruit tree when he was six years. The 11-year-old boy has successfully undergone corrective surgery at Focus Orthopedic Hospital with doctors excited about his recovery. But Kulman Dome reports Vesmark is due to be fully discharged to be reunited with his family in two weeks. He however has some outstanding bill of 60,000 cities to clear. I feel pains at night and I can't sit and write in school. I have to stand while writing. This disrupts my concentration in the classroom. I am unable to work for long. The little boy from Apersukubi in the Biakuya district of the Oti region reportedly fell off a fruit tree and dislocated his spine. His family, teachers and friends hoped someday help would reach Bismarck to have his condition corrected. I am pleading with the general public to support me raise money for my son's surgery. Two months after Joy News told the distressing story about the boy who is on the verge of dropping out of school because of his condition, help has come. And from the assurances we've gotten, we are optimistic that Bismarck will grow up being a normal child. Today, 
Bismarck's story has changed. With the help of some groups and individuals who contributed a total of 30,000 CDs, the 11-year-old has undergone the corrective procedure. I have successfully undergone the surgery. I am well. Bismarck can afford a smile and, of course, walk again. It's been only a couple of weeks since his surgery. He wants to return to his village and get back to normal life again. Thank you, everyone, for the support. But while his rehabilitation processes continue, there is an outstanding bill of 60,000 cities that needs to be cleared. Little Bismarck Tevo says, There is still the final part of my rehabilitation process. We need your help to settle the rest of the outstanding bills. As I leave the hospital, I am overcome by emotions, looking at the transformation that has happened in four months. Today, I see a happy little boy, a hopeful kid whose dream of becoming a soldier is not all gone after all. Health Matters was brought to you by Camel Buy and Fly to Dubai promo. Say yes to life. So please help Bismarck if you can. Now, four children in Suyani brutalized by military men for allegedly stealing a computer laptop are pleading for justice. The Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Shraj, promised the case would be closed by August 2018, but that did not happen. Shraj subsequently promised April 2019, but the case has yet, is yet to be concluded. The parents of the boys claim the men who brutalized their children teased them that this case would come to nothing. Meanwhile, two of the four boys still need medical attention. Precious, some of us report. The Bronga Hafu Regional Shraj Director, Halima Nuhu, promised the case will be closed by August 2018. On, on 3rd July, that was when we first requested for the comments. Hopefully, by the end of this week, we get all the information. And then we try to see what they have said in their comments and what the law says concerning the interaction of our the dealings of the military with civilian the civilian society. One of the boys could not write this year's basic education certificate exams due to ill health. Long distance. The youngest boy, who is now 14 years, also complains of headaches, and lately, he bleeds in the nose. The parents who are saddled with debts are calling on government to intervene. They are, however, unhappy with delay in concluding the case. Ye ye papa na ne sister ba kuni film no the twenty million eh shem sa tam no kachem ba na sa na me me kachem ba ne sa sam no strategy for sam no obi unu ne kura no kase onye ten pesos kura manen ye oma ba kanchi ne sa sam no se awu oma se sani ne ne madema ne madema oma oburu no asai no oma se sani ma no nti e oye wodan se so ye fo no an kasa mo bi baras omo mo wo baras ho bi a onum so ye fo no di nkomo no omo an na sababo ya mania join news check show 
The file has been transferred to the Shrine headquarters in Accra, but officials are not sure on the date the report will be released. Environmental officers have given 10 households here in Accra 24 hours to improve their sanitation of face court. The main challenge the Joy Clean Ghana campaign found was to do with the lack of toilets. The toilets in the households which had them were very were in a very bad shape. Nancy Emifajados went along with the team to the Ayawaso North Municipal Assembly and has a wrap of events. Going to part of Mamobi West, our normal house to house inspection. Meet Mariama Braima, environmental health officer for the Ayawaso North constituency. The sanitation in this area is so bad. That is why we want to go there for the inspection. We set off into the slums where the team finds a toilet facility serving both the household as well as the public. Public toilet. The conditions were awful and appeared not to have been cleaned for days. The inspector did not take it lightly when she found the septic tank. O toilet no flash e kwahe. Eko eko. E kwahe. E kwa e tank ni ni. It was broken and had been covered with a roofing sheet. Blocks and also a broken table. Say, I didn't know no. E dangerous. E dangerous. O bet na ti aso. Yes, broken slab. E was say musie sie. O bet ti aso no toma e papa. Enye papa, mo amu ni misa enye papa, anti mu di zinc akata so. Se obi meti aso. No ntom. Mpacho, let's issue him with a, 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 a notice. The operator had also kept some materials by the toilet. Any kwen say da? Containers in yina ansi o womono. Containers in yina ansi o womono. E pa in tontom. E pa in tontom. Ah tontom kaye. E ma ye yari malaria de bi ako hospital. When the team entered the house. We were met by this green semi mosquito pond. Madam Mariama quickly asked them to scoop out the water. News had already reached other public toilets in the community and they were busy scrubbing before we got there. Even though they were cleaning, the inspector spotted other things. Come here. You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. Hey, yes, sir. No, yes, sir. Hey, how can I? No, I can't. Can't finish. Shake. Yeah, can't. Ah, no, it's too much. Yeah, it's too much. I'm, I'm telling him that the water there is breeding mosquito. Then he's telling me he's aware. That's all. Then why, if you're aware, why do you allow the water there? That he will pour it away. As we moved to the next house, we find a chamber pot containing human excreta. Mm -hmm. They quickly disposed it off and swept the compound. 
Madame Naomi sells rice, but doesn't even know she's supposed to have a health card. Well, Dr. Krata, how do you know? Why not Dr. Krata? 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 Even worse was when we found a dark, dirty, green algae infected bathroom with the doors almost falling off. But we were yet to see the worst. This was a toilet that the team was confronted with. A panel train that was two feet long with the surface covered with a mixture of charcoal and ash. That's not all. Waste papers were scattered all over with feces also on the floor. Insanitary toilet in their premises and accumulation of waste papers in the toilet is, uh, i can't i don't even know how to describe it cry again it's very bad it's not good for the usage so we will ask them to stop using it they should close it they should demolish it then get the gamma toilet after insisting the landlord was not around the inspectors called him on the phone for years ghana has been looking for a solution to the motorbike transport problem as the city is swamped by operators and police say criminals use motorbikes to commit crime. Whereas motorbike transport riding is illegal in Ghana, in Benin it is a source of revenue for the local government authorities and a source of income for unemployed people. From our recent assignment in Benin, Joy News' Gifty Andwapia puts a spotlight on the Kada business in Kotonu and report even that booming business has not been immune from the dire effects of the closure of the border by Nigerian authorities. They only move on green lights at every traffic light. No one wants to be a victim to the rather vigilant Benin police. Transportation and unemployment are big issues the world over. Africa has its own peculiarities. Here in Benin, on almost every motorbike, I see men in bright yellow shirts with numbers embossed on their chests and backs. These men are helping to solve the transportation problems for their clients as they solve their individual problems of unemployment. I meet Abuba on the busy Martin Luther King Bridge in Kutunu. He is new to this business, which he chose to get by when he could not find a job. I started without papers, but I'm still in business. I was not finding any job. So I found a motorbike and started this one. You only need to know how to ride a motorbike and you have a job. Unemployment levels are high. So unlike here in Ghana, where commercial motorbike riding, popularly known as Okada, is still illegal, Benin's local government authorities are generating revenue and creating jobs through the Okada business by simply regulating it. This shirt is given to us by the local government from the mayor's office. The local government registers and gives you this number. They use this number to track you and your movement and to also safeguard the possibilities. 42 year old Matthew Awomenu is a commercial rider too. I have been riding a motor for more than 10 years now. It is very difficult in Benin to find a job. This is the most accessible. Once you find a motorbike, you can make some money to live on, at least every day. He tells me all he needed was to register as a commercial rider with the mayor's office after he secured a motorbike. You have to go to the local government and make payment of 70 CD. You'll be registered and then you pay every year. He then had a special number allocated to him 
through which the mayor's office is able to monitor and track their activities. Ten years in business and still running. He now has a farm to show for it and from which he takes care of his rather large family. I have two wives and eight children. The money I made from this business I have invested in the farm to so supplement the farm proceeds with what I'm still making here on the streets on the motorbike. Even with this, there are still complaints about lack of jobs in Benin, especially now that the Nigerian-Benin border has been closed. Since the border was closed, we, the motor riders, have been feeling the pinch. Some of our clients moved to and from the border, but now that has changed. The closing of the border means we have fewer clients. People are not crossing the border at all because they don't want to have a confrontation with immigration officers. Even though they complain that the closure of the Nigerian Benin border by Nigerian authorities is taking a toll on their business, it is clear the extent to which this intervention is solving problems, including unemployment, transportation difficulties and security for those who choose motorbikes instead of taxis like Kinsley. It makes John easier, faster, more good. You know, I prefer a car rather than a motorbike, but I don't have the money for a car. Regulating activities of commercial motorbike riders is a conversation Ghana has had for many years. Those against it say motorbike accidents account for majority of fatal road accidents, whilst those advocating for legalization say once they are being watched, motorbike-related accidents can be reduced irrespective of the current situation. It is a fact that hundreds of motorbike riders are operating commercially across the country. Kifti Andapia, join us, Kotonu, Benin. Now, there's a new way to keep your phone screen intact and safe. There's a, there's a technology called Nanometer hardens your phone's surface, making it difficult for it to crack. Priscilla Moore has been interacting with its pioneers. Ben Kodia and Kofi Bwedi, her report right to you. Mobile phones have become part of everyday life and users usually get jittery when they either lose the entire phone or crack the screen. The seeming depression that comes with the thought of having to part with extra money to change a cracked screen is immeasurable. This nightmare is fast changing thanks to the introduction of a technology that hardens the phone screen. Referred to as the nanometer, Producers Bernard Kodia and Kofi Buedi hope to use this technology to save you that extra spending. When the protector is removed, then I'm going to apply this one to clean it. And there's a wiper. I'll make sure I clean all the dirt on the phone. Now the phone is clean, well clean, so I'm going to apply the first, this one here, just a two drop, by like this, by like that, then I'll apply this one as well, just a drop. Then I have to wrap it on the phone, the whole phone. It's done. And I turn on the machine. So this is the machine, it's two of them. Then you put it like this. It face down. You close it, then you press it too. So now I can't take it off unless it's finished its work. Um, the first one will go off after two, three minutes, and the, 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 the green one will go off after seven minutes. Then it will cut off. So when the blue one go off, the machine will give you notice that, oh, yeah, thank you for using the nanometer coating machine. Then it goes on the another one until it's done. So when it's off, 
the machine is the, the, the phone is done. The technology is also cost effective and will prolong the lifespan of the phone. This thing started about four months ago and we, we realized that um, many of our phones that we are using, these Android phones, um, sometimes you buy a screen protector about a week, two weeks, you have to change it again and it's damaging our phones. You need to buy here and there, changing your screen. Sometimes you have to change the whole screen. And those screens are very expensive. So we find out that uh, this product, it will help people not to change their screen offering or change their screen protectors. But this one will coat your, your phone without scratching and then protecting the screen without, when it fell, mistakenly fell down without breaking. Priscilla Moss report for Joy News. Unfortunately, this news is coming to me rather too late because uh, I just got my phone screen cracked in a really, really bad way today. Um, well, too late for me.